In 1775, British authority is slowly collapsing across the 13 colonies. But it's in New England where the revolution has truly taken hold. The northeastern colonies have become the center of the rebellion against the British Parliament's attempts to dominate the colonies. And rebels have won control of the militias, courts, the press, and assemblies. While the British army is besieged in Boston, Congress and the Continental Army know that reinforcements from Europe will strike against them the following year, in 1776. Benedict Arnold, a recently appointed colonel in the Continental Army, has become a leading voice of the dangers posed by British control of the St. Lawrence River and the province of Quebec. He argues that if New York is seized, British armies could march from the north and the south to cut off New England and strangle the rebellion from both land and sea. Many also hope that their Canadian cousins will join them in rising against the British, and that Quebec will become the 14th colony to rebel. Congress invites Quebec to join the Continental Congress, but this is ignored and their calls to arms fall on deaf ears. French Canadians make up the majority in the province, and it's hoped they would have no love for the British authorities, who only recently incorporated Quebec into the empire in 1763. Although French Canadians may not be loyal to their new king, they equally do not trust the colonial Protestants, and for the most part, believe that their rights are safer in British rather than American hands. Congress has another reason to remove the British presence from Quebec. Agents of the Crown have begun mobilizing support among the Iroquois Confederacy, which constitutes the Six Nations of the Mohawk, the Oneida, Onondaga, Cayuga, Seneca, and the Tuscarora. In July, some 1,600 Mohawks are rallied for a raid into New England to keep the Continental forces on the defensive and out of Canada. But the British governor of Quebec, Guy Carlton, sends the Indians home out of fear that their presence will tip local opinion decisively in favor of the revolution. Fears in Congress of widespread Indian support for the British are wrong, and in 1775, the majority of the Iroquois Confederacy leans towards neutrality in what they see as a family affair, heeding Continental pleas to bury the hatchet deep. Governor Carlton does, however, maintain active support from some tribes, the Mohawks in particular, who provide supplies, harass Continental forces, and keep an eye on enemy movements. Governor Carlton has just 800 regulars to defend Quebec province, and he seeks to actively recruit local militia with limited success. Carlton also refortifies Fort St. John's, which guards entry to the province on the Richelieu River, and will act as the main line of defense against an invasion. By June, Congress has been convinced to invade Canada, and Major General Philip Schuyler is ordered north on an expedition to liberate or conquer. At the same time, Benedict Arnold convinces the newly named Commander-in-Chief of the Continental Army, George Washington, to send him on a second expedition from Maine. Following the swift capture of Fort Ticonderoga earlier in the year, Arnold confidently believes that after just 20 days, his forces will be demanding the surrender of Carlton in Quebec City. In August, the invasion of Canada begins as General Richard Montgomery, Schuyler's second in command, moves 1,200 men up the Richelieu River. Before Quebec City, they must first take Montreal and its surrounding forts. Carlton conducts a passive defence and does not actively use his Canadian militia and native allies to support the besieged force at St. John's, with its 700 regulars and militia trapped inside. By early November, without relief or supplies, the British garrison surrenders, and as news reaches Montreal, Loyalist militias evaporate. 
The remaining British forces are captured as they attempt to withdraw. Carlton slips away, dressed as a common man, making his way, alone and defeated, to Quebec City. The Americans have successfully defeated the bulk of the British army in the province, but their liberation of Montreal will soon prove unpopular with the locals. Catholic churches are arbitrarily shut down and taxes are imposed without representation in Congress and are only not lost on the Canadians. Combined with anti-French and anti-Catholic sentiment in the American ranks, popular support for the cause soon begins to waver. While Montgomery advances in Montreal, Benedict Arnold has been facing his own battle against the elements. By September, he has gathered some 1,100 men, including many frontiersmen from Virginia and Pennsylvania, and provisions for a journey of 180 miles. But his maps are wrong, and their march through the wilderness of Maine to Quebec City is in fact closer to 350 miles. Arnold's expedition starts well and with high spirits. His men cut across the dense and inhospitable landscape, fishing for food and carrying their boats where the rivers become too rough or shallow to pass. But heavy rains lead to dysentery, which is soon followed by snow, and the route starts to take its toll on Arnold's small army. The increasingly desperate men heroically push on, despite the lack of winter clothing, shelter, and even shoes. Some men are forced to eat leather, or in one instance an officer's dog, while others vote to abandon the expedition altogether. By the time they reach the outskirts of Quebec City in mid-November, the elements have thrown everything they can at the army, and nothing now stands in the way of Arnold's men and the siege they desperately crave. Benedict Arnold has lost almost half his army to the expedition, which now stands at 600 outside of Quebec City. Montgomery soon arrives with an additional 700 men, along with all important artillery pieces, and the joint force sets up camp outside the imposing city walls. Emissaries that are sent to demand a British surrender are shot, and letters that do reach Carlton are burnt in front of his men before being read. The message is clear, this time there will be no surrender or easy American victory. The British forces are led by the recently arrived Carlton and a battle-hardened Highlander, Alan MacLean, who had once fought against the Crown in the Scottish Jacobite Rebellion 30 years earlier. Carlton and MacLean are confident in their defences. The walls of Quebec are strong and they have marshalled an assortment of 1,800 troops, including local militia, Scottish Highland emigrants, a handful of marines, and large numbers of sailors drawn from ships in the harbour. Although Arnold remains confident of victory, the army has suffered. They are short on provisions, including ammunition, and many of their muskets have become unusable from the march. To make matters worse, a large number of soldiers' enlistments end on the 31st of December and they will soon return home. Despite the challenges, the men of the Continental Army doggedly set up artillery batteries and begin the Siege of Quebec. In a speech on Christmas Day, Montgomery announces that they will soon assault the city. He plans to envelop the weaker British defences in the lower town and then scale the walls to force a British surrender. They wait until December 30th for a storm to cover their movements, and Montgomery gives the order to attack. In the early hours, two diversionary forces move forward to feint attacks against Quebec's western wall and pin down and distract as much of the enemy as they can. Some of the men have written on their clothing, liberty or death. As they advance, the storm turns into a blizzard, dampening musket powder and making communication almost impossible. Arnold leads his men north, 
while Montgomery moves south around the main wall. They are soon spotted by sentries. Church bells ominously start to ring and loyalist militia arm themselves. Sensing that time is of the essence, while the bulk of the Continental force breaks down wooden palisades, Montgomery takes the initiative and moves with an advanced party of 50 men through the blizzard and into the streets of the lower town. Canadian militiamen and sailors are waiting for them, barricaded inside a makeshift blockhouse bristling with cannon. Montgomery bravely unsheaths his sword and leads his men forward, charging down the street toward the Canadians. The Quebec militia open fire and Montgomery and the men around him are struck down dead, with many more wounded. What remains of the force pulls back, including one Aaron Burr, a future Vice President of the United States. Without proper leadership, they decide that further attack is suicide and elect instead to fall back to the Plains of Abraham. Arnold's force has also made it to the lower town, dodging musket fire and grenades from the walls as they charge past. The first barricade is manned by 30 Canadians, and as Arnold prepares to charge it, he is hit in the leg by a musket ball. Against his wishes, he is carried from the field back to American lines. Daniel Morgan takes command and successfully charges the Canadians, taking them prisoner after a brief melee. They next run into a group of sailors who demand Morgan's surrender. Shooting their commander in the head, Morgan shouts, Quebec is ours, and the sailors flee in panic. As they move further into the city, Scottish Highlanders and Canadian militia are barricaded inside houses on both sides of the street and they open fire on the Continentals. Savage hand-to-hand -hand combat follows with bayonet against bayonet in the tightly packed buildings. But Morgan's men are eventually repulsed and they begin to fall back to a corner of the city. Fighting continues but the ragtag British forces and now squeezing the Americans into a corner who are starting to run dangerously low on ammunition. Reinforcements that try to reach Morgan's position are captured, finally making a breakout impossible. As day starts to break, one by one, unit by unit, the outnumbered and outgunned Continentals are slowly forced to surrender. By 10 a.m., the battle is over. British forces have suffered only minor casualties, with 19 dead and wounded in the struggle. Continental losses are far more significant, with over 500 dead, wounded and captured, almost half the army. British and Canadian morale is greatly lifted following the battle and committees are soon established to deal with local traitors that aided the American cause. Governor Carlton, however, does not take advantage of the precarious American position and sally out to complete the victory. With plenty of supplies, he has no reason to roll the dice on an open battle, as the French had done in 1759 at the Battle of the Plains of Abraham, which led to their defeat and the loss of Canada. For the Continental Army, the defeat is an important lesson in logistics and highlights the problem with short-term enlistments for soldiers which had forced a premature attack on Quebec. Arnold, now in sole command, has been left in a difficult position. With just 600 men, his requests for reinforcements are initially ignored, with fears of a pro-British uprising in Montreal and a growing number of Iroquois and other tribes joining the British cause further south. However, by April 1776, reinforcements have slowly trickled through and the Continental Army rises to 3,000 men under fresh command. But 11,000 British reinforcements are also on their way to Quebec. And in early May, ship masts are spotted down the river and American forces conduct a panicked retreat. Carlton is once again idle 
and slowly pursues the retreating Continentals despite a string of minor victories as they march south. Carlton imagines that his leniency in battle will win rebels over and make post-war reoccupation easier for the British. Arnold's defences around Montreal, although doomed, are energetic and he is successful in slowing the British advance until the start of winter. Carlton's passive advance, combined with Arnold's spirited defence, has prevented a full-scale British counter-attack in the summer of 1776, which may well have changed the outcome of the war. American forces have courageously and stubbornly marched into Canada, but the unforgiving environment and the high walls of Quebec were too great a challenge, and for now, there would be no 14th colony to join the rebellion. The British army in Canada, now under the command of General Burgoyne, will have to wait until the spring of 1777 to launch their planned counteroffensive to end the rebellion once and for all. But in the meantime, a few hundred miles east, another British force is on the move and heading for New York City on a confrontation with George Washington. A genuine thank you for watching our series on the American Revolution. Please consider liking and subscribing or leaving a tip with the thanks button below. You can also join our YouTube or Patreon membership community to get early access and vote on future videos. Thank you again and until next time.